let's talk about high intensity interval training. So let's define that. So when we're thinking about that, is that a function of maximum heart rate? How, how are you defining high intensity? Is it like Norwegians, is it like the four by fours? Is it Tabata? How do you like to look at high intensity training? High intensity and sprint interval are two different things. Like sprint interval training is within high intensity interval training. And it's really hard to use heart rate if we're looking at specific intervals for some people because there's a lag in the time it takes for the metrics to be caught by a wearable. I like to use rating of perceived exertion. And people can kind of more understand when I say on a scale of one to 10 for high intensity interval training for the intervals we want you to be working about an eight. And that interval could be anywhere from one to six minutes. And then when the recovery time is variable as well, are we looking for more lactate production? Maybe we're doing eight at four to five minutes. Are we looking at more power-based stuff? Maybe we're doing one minute that's at closer to a nine. So the intensity in there and the variable recovery is what makes the metabolic outcomes. When we're looking at sprint interval training, this is a completely different and a subset of high intensity interval training. So sprint interval training is 30 seconds or less as hard as you possibly can go. So on the scale of one to 10, you might be 10 or 11. And then the recovery is two to four minutes because we're looking for complete metabolic and central nervous system recovery because it is a really maximal stress on the body. And you might only be able to do two to three when you first start. And ideally you don't wanna do more than six. So there is that subset, and both of them are very effective at changing body comp, but they do it in different mechanisms in different ways. So we're looking at high-intensity interval training, which is a little bit less intense and has variable recovery. This is more of a a conversation that we're getting better blood, blood pressure control because we're having more shear stress on the blood vessels. We are having more myokines released from the skeletal muscle to say, hey, we don't need to store visceral fat. We're also producing lactate, which is a preferred fuel for the brain. So we are able to help with the brain metabolism misstep that's occurring in perimenopause. When we look specifically at sprint interval training, this is a very strong stress that will cause more of an epigenetic response over time where we're actually changing the way that the muscle fiber is responding. We're able to use more ATP, CP. We're able to generate more of what we call our GLUT4 proteins, which are kind of like the doors that open without insulin to pull glucose in. So we get better glucose homeostasis over time. And both of them are very effective at shutting down that visceral fat gain. Amazing. Okay, so just for the listener, ATPCP is the ATP cross creatine phosph- phosphal creatine system. So this is when often this is the energy that's often reserved in the muscle for very high intense, you know, very the sprint interval training that Stacy is is describing here as well. And so let's let's do if you can give maybe an example of high tech and low tech. If someone has maybe access to a gym, what would be a piece of equipment that they might think about doing high intensity interval training on? Is there a preferred, is it, is it a stationary bike? Is it a treadmill? D- do you care? Do you care if it's, if it's weight bearing or non-weight bearing? Or if someone doesn't have access to a gym, would it be just finding like a local high school with a track and seeing, you know, timing yourself and seeing how much distance you can cover? It's really dependent on the individual because there are some people who hate running and then there are some people who absolutely love it. And then there are joint issues that come into play, especially when we start getting into perimenopause. So it's whatever mode of activity that will allow you to hit those intensities. If we're in a gym situation for sprint interval training, I really like people to use an assault bike because it's a, it's really hard and it has a good timer and you feel it or a rowing erg because then it's a total body as well. Treadmill is harder because you have to get it up to speed and you have to be very comfortable at running super fast yeah. and then being able to yeah. jump off, which isn't that safe. So I prefer using an ERG that gives you more control over it and also monitors power. If we're outside and you don't run, it could be stairs. You're really pushing to get up the stairs a lot faster. It could be walking up an incline. If you have access to kettlebell or something like that in your garage, you can use kettlebell overhead swings or snatch as your high-intensity work. 
We can even look at battle ropes, either at your house or at the gym, because those also can really invoke a total body high intensity interval as well. So it really does depend on where you are and what you have available and what you find you can maximally put forth the effort without hurting yourself or, or getting mentally like I can't do this. And frequency for so high intensity interval training, how often are you looking to do that? And would you would you categorize sprint interval training as a subcategory of hit of, of high intensity interval training? And if yes, how many times would you like people to be doing that per week or bi weekly? Yeah, so sprint interval, maybe twice a week. And then with one high intensity interval session, but if you're like the sprints too hard right now, I just can't, I can't get to that intensity, I'm not robust enough, that's fine. Then we look to doing two of the high intensity interval trainings that are a little bit lower in the intensity with that variable recovery. Great. And let's talk about zone two. So lots of lots of bros will say love to talk about zone two, which is fine. I, I love it's like, I love the word that you used before. Did you say soul food? Is that yeah. what you used for? Okay, so yeah. soul food, it's great. Why are women why do you think that women are different in terms of how often we should be doing zone two? So the recommendation for zone two, if I'm getting my numbers right, and I'm, I'm happy to fact check myself for the show notes, but I believe it's somewhere between 150 and 180 minutes per week of some, I think it's cardiovascular training in general, but generally the, the zone two training, that's the number that I often hear thrown around. Do you agree with that? Do you think it should be less than that, more than that, and why? Pull it back to sex differences at birth. Okay, so we have to understand that we don't have enough research to go beyond the, the binary XXXY. So when I'm talking about sex differences at birth, I'm talking about XX versus XY. So we see that girls and boys are born differently with different muscle morphology, so the types of muscle fibers. Women are born with more of those endurance oxidative fibers, not the type 2 glycolytic, but more of our type 1 slow twitch. With that also comes better mitochondria density, better mitochondrial capabilities of, of regenerating and stopping oxidative and inflammatory responses. We also have more of the proteins in the mitochondria that help pull in and use free fatty acids. So when we start going through our life and we get through puberty, when we get into our reproductive years, we also have estrogen that enhances mitochondrial capabilities and, and ability to pull in free fatty acids and use it. We get to perimenopause and postmenopause when estrogen drops off. We revert back to those sex differences. When we look at the endurance fibers, we still have that mitochondrial density and mitochondrial function more so than men. So when we're looking at why people do zone two, it's to improve mitochondrial health and it's in to improve meta metabolic flexibility or the ability to use more free fatty acids and switch between glucose and free fatty acids. Women, by the, by the way of being born XX, are already more metabolically flexible and becomes very apparent when we're in our reproductive years because estrogen and progesterone fluctuation change our metabolic flexibility regardless of what we're doing. So when we're looking at all the recommendations of why people should be doing zone two, it doesn't hold water for female physiology. Because when we're looking at increasing the ability to burn free fatty acids and improve mitochondrial function and health and to improve metabolic flexibility, women are already there. So I tell men that they should do it to become more like women because women are more endurant, more robust, have more antioxidative and anti-inflammatory properties by the nature of how robust their mitochondria are. When we talk about zone two and how often you should do it, I always tell women, look, we will have a limited amount of time during the week. If you have all the time in the world, go ahead, do all the zone two stuff, but put that second, do your strength training and your intensity work first. For people who are endurance athletes and training up for something, we have to factor that zone two in. We have to factor in some of the moderate intensity because that's the kind of training we need to be successful at whatever endurance event we're doing. But for general population, it becomes an additional stress. Where women are like, I have to get the zone two in, yet I have to do these sprints and I have to do strength training. I don't know what I'm doing or how do I fit it in and it becomes too confusing. So when I bring it back down to the basic physiology and why we're doing certain things, 
I tell women, look, we want to do the high intensity because we don't have a lot of those glycolytic type 2 fibers and we lose them as we age. And there's a very strong rationale for trying to maintain and build that. And that has to do with brain health because we see there's a sex difference in the onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. And there's a precipitous change in brain metabolism in perimenopause when we have a drop in estrogen. And that becomes a misstep in glucose metabolism. The preferred fuel of the brain is lactate. So if we're able to produce more lactate and maintain those fibers that produce lactate, then we're also providing a fuel for the brain and the brain is like, oh, okay. And so we get rid of that risk factor of brain metabolism misstep and a risk factor for cognitive decline. So when we look at zone two, that pathway doesn't happen for the brain. So that's the, the big overview of all of it. 